There we go. Now, now we're recording. Right. Once again, I want to introduce you all to Take Kim, who is an acupuncturist and naturopathic physician who I met on my uh, networking journeys to build up my pain practice. Hey, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming, having me on board, Dr. Boom. And uh, Tay is, like most of us, dealing with the COVID shutdown and is uh, forced to do the, the interview from his car today to avoid waking up his kids. So I want to thank you for going the extra mile to accommodate and be here with us. So uh, tell, tell us a little bit about your training, about your practice and background. Okay, so I've been in clinical practice for the past 10 years. I built my practice uh, in the town of Manhasset in Long Island. And my training is a little bit more traditional than most people out there. Most people learn acupuncture and herbs in a very university setting. Uh, I learned it from a teacher who, was, who learned it from his teacher and goes back many, many, many generations. And I was taught four things instead of two things, what they teach in the university setting, which was one, tool medicine, which was acupuncture and all the tools that comes along with it in an acupuncture practice. And two was herbs and diet. Three is bone setting, what they call physical manipulations. I don't do chiropractic adjustments. They're based on ballistics. So I do it in the form of a stretch. And last, I do what they call qigong, uh, which is a mind, body, breath, unified practice. It's like a Chinese version of yoga. So I learned those four things. I traveled around the world, China, Thailand. Uh, I came back and I started traveling across the country to learn more. And it's been a fun journey all the way here. Wow. And uh, what, what type of conditions do you treat? I treat a lot of musculoskeletal conditions, um, things like sciatica, uh, back pain, neck pain. And I treat it in order to fix the posture. Uh, so when you fix somebody's posture, they're able to breathe better. So everybody these days now have what they call technology neck. They have a forward head, round the shoulders, go about. And if you're stuck in this position, try to take a deep breath in, it's very limited. However, if we put you back into the correct position, you're able to breathe better. And I discovered sounds that through- like the, Sounds a little bit like some of the osteopathic manipulative uh, medical techniques, OMM they call it, which is where they help to loosen up the, well, there's a lot of different things they do. Before I understand, I'm not, I'm not an osteopath, is they actually loosen up some of the, the muscles of the rib cage or accessory muscles to help you take a deeper breath, also with the posture, yes. of course. Yes, yes, yes. And I discovered these things through yoga, and mm -hmm. there was a lady by the name of, um, what was her name? Uh, it escapes me. She's from Yoga Flow Studios in Glen Cove. Uh, Lorraine Aguilar. She's a physical therapist and a uh, yogi. And she helped me understand about yoga a lot more from a medical perspective because she has that physical therapy background. And, and, and other teachers as well. Yeah, about the posture. So I treat those things. I also treat a lot of um, women's health, like uh, using herbs, uh, fertility. I also help treat um, postmenopause. I treat a lot of allergy cases. I've gotten rid of a lot of um, peanut allergies, seasonal allergies. Um, and okay. for some time, time out, time yeah. out, time. Remember, your audience is a bunch of doctors. You said you've gotten rid of peanut allergies. Be very careful. What exactly do you mean when you say you've gotten rid of peanut allergies? Because of that's something that a lot of us are going to be a little critical about here. So, what exactly do you mean? So people who were allergic to peanuts, they would have a, um, a reaction to peanuts, sometimes anaphylactic. And after receiving about 10 sessions of acupuncture, their allergies gets minimized. And when they come back the following year, uh, for another 10, 10 more sessions, their allergy seems to slowly disappear over a period of time. And then uh, one of the guys that works across the hall um, he one day told me, Hey, I had a peanut and I didn't have any reactions. So he's one of the few people that I got, um, peanut allergies, uh, no longer in them anymore. Uh, I have, okay. I'm going to put you, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Okay. So, okay. so that's, that's great. But the question is, is there, is there evidence? Is there literature saying that acupuncture could help with a peanut allergy or mitigate aller allergic reaction? Because going from anaphylaxis to nothing and exposure of peanut 
that's a big deal. So, so is there any evidence for this or is this an anecdotal case? There is an evidence based on research in South Korea, but they were not able to replicate that uh, study again with the same success rate. So, so it's not consistent. Right. Okay. Yeah, because uh, that's a big deal. Um, if you yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah stating and deadly um but if i mean acupuncture does a lot of things i think we fully don't understand i've definitely had patients come back and tell me it works it doesn't work for everything and it doesn't work in every patient but there's definitely benefit to it and i i think the risk is minimal would you mind giving us shedding some light on your uh naturopathic background and and what you've been doing with the herbs and whatnot okay so i'm technically not a naturopathic uh person um, a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Uh, I just got my, I just graduated while I was, you know, I uh, just graduated this year, um, right before the shutdown. And what is that? The herbs consist of about more than close to 400 different herbs. And they're based on the chi of what the herbs are. And what I mean by chi is the taste and temperature of whatever is considered to be edible and that these tastes and temperatures they function with a factor of time. So what this means is if you eat Dunkin' Donuts, it tastes sweet, and sweet has a function to give you energy. If you too, eat too much of it, it makes you crash. If you eat three times a day every day for a whole month, you start gaining weight, and the ancient understanding why sweet makes you gain weight is that anything that is sweet, whether it's flour, uh, honey, sugar, fruits, it tends to be sticky in nature. So the more sticky stuff you eat, the more it sticks on you. Like spicy hot things in the ancient text, it says opening and moving. And those are the chi of, or the function of spicy hot things. Now, when you really think about that, what does that mean? It says things like, if you eat something very spicy, well, you start opening your mouth and then you start moving your hands, your pores begin to open up, your sweat begins to move. And worst case scenario, your other end opens up and you then and you got to move your bowels. So the function of opening and moving is consistent throughout the person. Another example would be sour. Uh, sour, according to the ancient text, it says that it is very pulling and astringent. And if you stick the lemon in your mouth and you bite down, you make a very pulling to that side. You make a face, mmm, that's sour. You don't go, ah, that is sour. So the ancient understanding of this particular uh, fun understanding was very illuminating to the modern scientific world. And that was very well known in Beijing back in the early 90s because they found that astragalus, uh, this one herb, was increasing the white blood cell count. And when they started making uh, astragalus uh, IV drips for cancer patients to increase their immune system, a lot of them started dying. And one of the old, um, Dr. Xie from Beijing, came out and said, you guys are doing something backwards. You guys are forgetting our own tradition of understanding the chi of the herbs. This is sweet. We know that sweet makes the cancer grow. And you're using sweet herbs because it's a scientific, you know, understanding research shows that it in increases white blood cell count. It's not the way to go about doing it. So they switched back to a lot of the uh, bitter and cold herbs, and they had a higher success rate. So that was a very illuminating um, situation in China where modern understandings of herbs clashing with old and kind of like brought new now that now they're functioning a lot better i see very interesting and uh speaking of the herbs um and you know we are in the pandemic now you mentioned when i met you that there were some herbs that were uh, found to show they were shown to benefit in patients suffering from covid19 yes yes uh, so one immune booster that became very very popular in the past two, three years, more like last year and this year would be the, uh, the American formula called uh, elderberry syrup. And a lot of the stuff I make tastes horrible. And I didn't want to you know, do that to my daughter who's five years old. And my wife is like, you know, uh, I hear herbal medicine is really good for children and it boosts up their immune system in these conditions. So why don't you make it? I was like, oh, okay. So I decided to make elderberry, which was not a Chinese formula. And she loves it. And she's one of the few kids in her whole entire kindergarten class who hasn't been sick throughout this whole season and last year as well. And, but there are herbs called um, 
that the Chinese government endorsed, which was called, um, which uh, consists of three different herbs, uh, Huang Chen, um, Lian Chao, and Jin Yu Hua. And those, the, the last three ingredients I mentioned, they're in a classic formula called Yin Chao San, which is uh, used commonly for the flu. And they use this in the MERS epidemic, the SARS epidemic, and it has shown to, through scientific research and literature, and I'd be happy to send you those articles that I have. Uh, it shows that it, 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 it inhibits the, um, the virus from replicating inside the body. And so when the SARS outbreak happened many years ago in China, uh, uh, these Chinese herbalists says, we know herbs that's gonna help this. And the Chinese medical group said, that's kind of like, very bold for you guys say that. And the Chinese herbalist perspective is, well, this has worked for thousands of years. And so there was a clash. And at the end of the day, when the epidemics was, you know, uh, over, when they, when they looked at the data, they found out that the towns where they were using these Chinese herbs had a hot, less incidence of people going from um, medium, medium cases to more severe cases or mild cases to severe. They published and, this. This is a retrospective analysis. They published. They published this. Yes, they published this. They published okay. this. Okay, I, I, I would love to po post the show notes. That any links to any research you have, because it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I made that video uh, for people to watch because it was just so much information to tell. You know, story after, and that's how the YouTube video came about, and people watched it, and it links all the links into. Um, at the end as well. So, but I'll be happy to send you those articles. That'd be and great. When the outbreak happened uh, for COVID-19, the Chinese government endorsed this three different ingredients called Shuang Huang Lian. And everybody went after it and it started going up dry. And when I saw it in around like uh, Lunar New Year, I was like, okay, uh, I should get my hands on it because I see it coming here. And I got some and then I, so far, I've treated about uh, more than a dozen cases. And for this one lady in Bayside, where I live, uh, she went from mild to severe back to mild, and now she's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I have another couple. Uh, the father was um, tested positive. The children had a, they were track runners. They had a hard time breathing. Uh, and they took the herbs, they recovered within about uh, about a week later, their fever stopped. So a lot of these uh, herbs that I used, about three, four days, three, four days. And it's oftentimes very I had a friend who had fever for about 10 days. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means the virus is digging in. Yeah, uh, especially it's dangerous when people experience what they call chills and fever. They get, uh, they grow this fever and then they get chills. They grow fever and they get chills. When that begins to happen, it starts really digging in deeper and deeper into your body. Um, but for most cases that I've seen is their people are, are asymptomatic uh, or very mild. They didn't know that they had it for a long time. They thought it was not something COVID-19. Uh, and I had a friend's father who recently died. Um, and he showed symptoms, uh, after he showed symptoms within two hours, the guy was, you know, but he didn't even make it to the hospital. So this virus, when it does grow inside people and start replicating, you don't know how much damage is really causing. And for a lot, and it's hard to gauge the danger of this virus right now. And that's, that's why I have a hard time saying this is like the flu, not like the flu, because for some cases it's very severe like my friend's father's case. And for a lot of people who are healthy, they're, they seem to be asymptomatic. Right, and then there's some people saying that you get better, but then you could all of a sudden get really bad, uh, get deteriorate, your condition can deteriorate after appearing to improve a little bit. So yeah, the, the jury's definitely out with this virus. Um, back to um, pain management, since it's a pain management podcast. Um, Tell me more about um, your techniques and if, if there's any herbs that you recommend. So just to treat you know, a variety of pain conditions. Um, herbs, 
it's a hit or miss because it's not as strong as some medications out there. So, but it's considered to be natural. Uh, so for pain management, I usually don't prescribe any herbs other than anti-inflammatory herbal ingredients like MSM. Or the popular one that everyone seems to be using is CBDs for the past two, three years. And sure. CBDs has become very popular. Uh, but a lot of uh, scientific evidence shows that uh, constant use of CBD uh, for extended period of time shows liver scarring. So I kind of stay away from that. Uh, although even though it's very popular. So I you treat a lot of cases by stretching because the way I see it is when the muscle is very, very tight, it compresses on the nerve. It prevents blood flow to the area. And by stretching it, you're allowing more blood flow. Uh, that's the general category that I move in. And I try to stretch the body using Korean physical body manipulation techniques. So I start from the foot and going up. And there are traditions where you start from the neck going down. And I'm not here to say which works better. And I think it's what is more appropriate for the patient, depending on the case that they have. Uh, I've seen a lot of sciatic cases that comes from the lower back, uh, the hip, and sometimes hamstrings, believe it or not. When the hamstrings get really, really tight, it pulls on the sciatic nerve. I've seen that happen over and over and over. But according to textbooks, it only ha occurs due to the lower back and hip area. Um, and what I do for that is I put needles for lower back L1 through L5. Uh, I try to hit the piriformis muscle. Uh, it's called um, gallbladder 30 in the acupuncture textbooks. And then I target the uh, tightest hamstrings. And that usually gets the muscle tension to let go in the sciatic nerve. And then after that is a lot of, you know, appropriate stretching uh, that I learned from Thailand. Um, have you ever had a uh, Thai massage? Yeah, once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, they put, you, they put you in this, like, uh, they do yoga for you pretty much. And there's right. some, yeah, they put you in these um, twisting motions, and they put you in this, like, stretch mode, and they have you breathe, and they do a lot of PNF stretches. And so that's one half of the component. And the other part is rehab, which means people got to teach them the correct exercises to put their body back where they belong. And one thing that I'm not good at is teaching people how to do those things. But one exercise I did learn was how to strengthen the lower back. And I went to a seminar about a year ago and they put the steel chair out there. And the trick is to grab the bottom of the chair and pick it up and there was a guy from the NFL. His name was Barry or something. I didn't know at the time he was an NFL player, but the guy was really, um, I'm going to use the word chiseled. You know, he, he looked very fit. And he didn't pick up the chair. But I was able to pick up the chair because I practiced how to do that one exercise in the lower back. With one arm or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. yeah. a way to pick it up. Uh, okay. there, basically, if you were able to work out your lower back consistently basically uh, according to physics when you stand there is equal amount of uh, weight pushing back onto your body because you're generating a downward force and therefore you remain at equilibrium so there's also energy or force being pushed up onto the body but for most people it stops on the ankle or at their knee and in ancient times in martial artists, they figured there were people able to listen to that, you know, upward force in the body. And they were able to channel that beyond to the hip and to the arm. And if you strengthen the lower back, you develop this thing called inner wave inside your body. And using that strength, you're able to pick up that uh, chair. And that is an indication of that. And I'd like to add so, to that. I mean, based on my knowledge of, um, of, of, of this topic. I, I think a big part of that also um, is not just the low back muscles, it's actually, I think a lot of it's the oblique muscles, the ability to stabilize your body, with the oblique muscles of the abdomen. And it kind of almost goes along with the ability of um, having a skinnier, weaker person, having the, well, maybe weaker relatively, uh, 
having the ability to do a one arm push up versus a big bodybuilder not being able to do so. So that big bodybuilder may be yes. a lot stronger, but that skinnier person, and for, of course, you know, for his body weight, which is probably less, if they have their core and their oblique muscles properly engaged and, and conditioned, they could actually you know, bear that weight on just one side light like you probably did with the chair. That's, that's my explanation. I mean. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and, and, but the understanding of those two people, one person having one dimensional muscles being a lot stronger where the skinnier person who's strong in that one thing, although they don't have the muscles, they were able to use their whole body. So it's all about learning how to use your whole body to do certain things. And I think that's, that's right. the differentiation of uh, body mechanics. So some people have body mechanics and some people don't. And that uh, demonstration of lifting the chair, uh, if you have good posture and you're able to generate these muscles in your back, and yes, you are right. Uh, the oblique do play a, ro a role because when you try to strengthen that muscle in the back, you can't help but to strengthen the obliques as well. So it comes as a one package uh, as a whole thing. And That's right. I um, I was uh, training with a, a trainer who has a lot of background in kinesiology, physical therapy, yoga, everything. And he's the guy that all the doctors in the gym go to. And he knows what he's doing. And he um, not only taught me a lot about this stuff, but he also made sure that when you do a workout, and I, actually I do have a picture of one of the workouts on my Instagram page. And it's kind of me being... Um, pulling on one of those, uh, I don't know if it's a TRX band or something, stabilizing my body in the air, sort of, horizontal, with one leg being pulled this way, um, and the other leg, the hip flexors engaged to kind of have my um, core working at the same time as my upper body stabilizing the position. And then at points, I might even take my leg out into a horizontal plane, but outward. So basically the point of this was not only to work out in two dimensions, but you're getting a workout in three dimensions and you're doing certain exercises while you're forcing your core muscles to be engaged on either the contralateral side or the, or the ipsilateral side, depending on what you're doing, of course. So yeah, I, I think uh, you bring up a very important point in terms of the treatment of pain, pain problems that are especially musculoskeletal yeah. as well as uh, prevention, more importantly. So, so I, if somebody, yes, go ahead. Somebody, somebody came to you with a pinched nerve in the neck, what would you do? Pinched nerve on the neck? Um, I think a lot of traction based uh, maneuvers uh, to try to find out where the impingement is. And one thing I did learn was that the meninges uh, inside the human, um, where the spinal cord attaches inside, is not a perfect fit. And there was a Japanese doctor whose job was to cut cadavers and notice a pattern. And his note reflected to another doctor he, he had never met. And either it attached more to the left or to the right in a squiggly pattern, in a spiral pattern. And after I learned this, thing, this technique called meningeal releases, uh, that tends to unhinge the spine, uh, just a little, give it more room. And that was able to release a lot of the tension in the neck. And it's not whether I'm moving to the left or the right, it's more of a rotational. So, so you have to identify the pattern first. So there's a thing called a sit test. So you have a person sit uh, facing away from you and then they sit and then you ask them to sit up and then you put a little like, a, like not even a quarter of an inch uh, maybe one third of an inch. Uh, and then you ask them to sit and you put it on your left hip and see if they're leaning to the right or how they feel more to the right, leaning to the right. And then you compare it to that to the other side. And every person has one side that is more leaning towards one side. And that is an indication of where the meninges are more attached to. And I stretch people based on that pattern. And that seems to usually help. And impinged nerves usually happens because the body tends to, how do you say, um, slump forward naturally. No one slumps backwards, right? And due to technology, computer, phones, so everybody leans to forward. So after I stretch, I teach them how to uh, tuck in their chin a little bit, 
use two fingers to gently push back and create a traction going up at the same time. And mm. by holding those positions three times a day, it for a lot of people who's severely impinged, that gives them relief uh, throughout sure. the day, you know, intermittently. So it depends on the case, but uh, oftentimes acupuncture needles goes in on the areas of tight muscles to re help them relax them. Um, Cause you know, when you put a needle on a tight muscle, you're putting a hole there and blood will get in, lubricate, and it just help them open up a little bit. Right. Well, we do that quite a bit with our trigger point injections. Yes. I wouldn't use yes. I wouldn't use the word lubricate. I'd use more of the word of we, we create some micro trauma with the needle, and we could actually get some fresh blood into the areas that maybe are having too much muscle spasm, and maybe there's not a good capillary flow, and therefore the pain is getting worse, and maybe some sort of metabolic byproducts like lactic acid or something is building up there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds great. Um, so uh, before we wrap it up, uh, if anyone's interested in acupuncture services in Long Island or to learn more about uh, the, the other techniques you have that you've mentioned, uh, how could they contact you? Uh, they can reach me through www5, F-I-V-E, uh, phases, P-H-A-S-E-S dot -E -S com. So fivephases.com. That's my website. Great. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been very helpful. And uh, if you send me those links, I'll post them. And uh, have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblum. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been really fun. And I got to invite you to one of those uh, breathing workshops that boosts up the immune system. Um, Wim Hof won the, uh, the people, the scientists who studied Wim Hof method won the Nobel Prize in Science last year. And I teach these techniques to help boost up the uh, immune system just by breathing. And it's always available. You don't need an insurance card. Um, <laughs> and there's this, there's, I'll send you scientific literature on that too. It's really cool. Okay. Thank you. Look forward to it. Take okay. care. Take care. Bye.